We've discussed the idea of the Hausdorff topological space. This Hausdorff condition sort of functioned for us as a kind of supplement to the idea of compactness. And we saw that compact Hausdorff spaces were sort of exceptionally nice in the realm of topological spaces. Hausdorffness is one of many different separation axioms, or Trennungsaxioma, and we're going to see a whole bunch of others today. To begin, we're going to describe two rather simple sort of bedrock separation conditions, and they work as follows. If x is a topological space, we'll say that two points x and y are topologically indistinguishable if and only if they have the same open neighborhoods. So in other words, every open neighborhood of x is also an open neighborhood of y and vice versa. We then say that x is Kolmogorov or T0 if and only if every pair of topologically indistinguishable points are equal. In other words, if x and y are distinct points of x, then there is either an open neighborhood of x that doesn't contain y or an open neighborhood of y that doesn't contain x. Here are some examples. If p is a preorder, then the Alexandrov topology on p is T0, Kolmogorov, if and only if P is actually a poset. Remember, P being a poset means that if X is less than or equal to Y and Y is less than or equal to X, then X and Y are equal. A more sophisticated example is the following. If we think of topological indistinguishability, that's an equivalence relation on any topological space. That is to say, if if we say that x and y are similar, if and only if x and y are topologically indistinguishable, that's a nice equivalence relation. We can then form the quotient space with respect to that equivalence relation, and that quotient space will be T0, essentially by definition. This is called the Kolmogorov quotient, and this appears in analysis all the time. Here's a lemma. The following are equivalent for a topological space. First, that for every pair of points x and y, if either x is close to y, or y is close to x, then x equals y. That's condition one. Condition two is that for every pair of distinct points, x and y, there exists an open neighborhood u of x such that y is not contained in u. Third, every singleton is closed. Fourth, every finite subset of X is closed. If any, and therefore all of these conditions, are satisfied, then we say that the topological space in question is T1. So these two conditions, T0 and T1, these are kind of bedrock conditions that are then going to support the rest of the conditions that we want to contemplate. These are sort of minimal niceness conditions that we want to have. So let's observe that if you have a topological space that's T1, then it's automatically T0. But the converse isn't true. For example, if I take the Alexandrov topology on the poset 0, 1, well, the Alexandrov topology is rigged so that 1 is open and 0 is closed. But this is not open and this is not closed. So this is not T1, but it is indeed T0. The open neighborhoods of 0, there's only one of them. But the open neighborhoods of 1, well, 1 itself is open, and the whole thing is open. So there are two open neighborhoods of the number 1, and there's only one open neighborhood of the number 0. Okay, good. So with that in place, we're now going to look at the rest of the separation axioms. And there's a whole pile of them, and it's convenient to have some language to describe these things. So let x be a topological space, and consider two subsets s and t of x. We're going to talk about S and T being separated by various kinds of structures. So let's write that down. First, we'll say that S and T are separated by neighborhoods if and only if there exists open sets, U and V, such that S is contained in U, T is contained in V, and U and V are disjoint. 
In this case, we say that S and T are separated by neighborhoods. And already here you can see that if points are separated by neighborhoods, that's exactly the condition to be Hausdorff. There's a stronger variant of the same idea, which is that you could be separated not by neighborhoods, but by closed neighborhoods. What does that mean? That means that our S and our T are contained in open sets U and V, respectively, whose closures do not intersect. In that case, we say that S and T are separated by closed neighborhoods. An even stronger condition is that you be separated by a function. We say that S and T are separated by a function if and only if there exists a continuous map from X to the closed interval from 0 to 1, such that all of the points of S go to 0 and all of the points of T go to 1. Notice that what I'm not saying here is that I'm not allowing other points to go to 0. Some other stuff can go to 0 as well, but I'm guaranteeing that at least the points of S must go to 0, and similarly at least the points of T must go to 1. And now finally, we can say that S and T are precisely separated by a function if and only if there's a continuous map from X to the closed interval from 0 to 1 such that all and only those points of S go to 0 and all and only those points of T go to 1. In other words, the inverse image of 0 is S and the inverse image of 1 is T. Notice that in this condition, S and T will have to be closed, because if this is to be continuous, then since the singleton zero is closed, the inverse image of it must be closed. So this will force S to be closed, and this will also force T to be closed. So we can only really speak of closed subsets being precisely separated by a function. Okay, now let's use these phrases to define all the various kinds of separation axioms that we can think of. Well, first, our topological space is always going to be T1. That's sort of a background condition for these separation axioms. So first, as we saw, X is Hausdorff, or T2, if and only if every pair of distinct points is separated by neighborhoods. That's the definition we saw a few lectures ago. We can improve on it slightly. We can say that X is Eurozone, or T2 and a half, if and only if every pair of distinct points are separated by closed neighborhoods. Still stronger, we can say that X is regular Hausdorff, or T3, if and only if every closed subset and every point of X not contained in that subset are separated by neighborhoods. So the picture here is that we have our X, we have a point, which we want to call little x, and we have a closed z. And the condition is that I can find an open neighborhood of x and an open neighborhood of z that are disjoint from one another. Next, we say that x is taken off or t3 and a half, if and only if every closed subset z and every point x not contained in z are separated by a function. This time there's a function f from x to the closed interval from 0 to 1, such that all of the points of z go to 0 and the point x goes to 1. Stronger still is for us to say that X is normal Hausdorff, or T4, if and only if every pair of disjoint closed subsets, Z1 and Z2, are separated by neighborhoods. Here the picture looks like the following. We have our X, and we have two closed subsets, Z1 and Z2. 
And the condition to PT4 is that I can find open neighborhoods that do not intersect. Next we have T5, or completely normal Hausdorff. We say that X is T5 if and only if every pair of subsets, S and T, with the property that S doesn't intersect the closure of T, and T doesn't intersect the closure of S, these are separated by neighborhoods. This is the condition to be completely normal Hausdorff. And now finally we have T6, perfectly normal Hausdorff. And this is the condition that every pair of disjoint closed subsets, Z1 and Z2, are precisely separated by a function. So there's a continuous map from our X to the closed interval from 0 to 1, such that the inverse image of 0 is Z1 and the inverse image of 1 is Z2. And that's the condition T6. So the observation, and it's not an entirely a trivial observation, is that if you have a topological space that's T6, then it's T5. If it's T5, then it's T4. If it's T4, then it's T3.5. If it's T3.5, then it's T3, etc., etc., etc. Each of these implies the next, and none of these implications is reversible. For every single one of these implications, there's an example of a space that's T2.5, but not T3 and one that's t3, but not t3 and a half, and so forth and so on. In general, these counterexamples are slightly annoying to write down and unpleasant to reflect upon. So we won't discuss these counterexamples in much detail. What's more important is to think about which of these conditions is sort of most relevant for our work. In my experience, the conditions that have been most relevant have been t0, that's a sort of minimal condition that says, roughly speaking, this is the condition that says that if two points have distance zero, then they're actually equal. T1, which guarantees that points are closed. Hausdorffness. T3 and a half, for reasons that I'll describe in a minute. T4, for other reasons I'll describe in a minute. And that's roughly it. In my experience, one doesn't deal with T6 spaces that don't already have other nice properties that you want to contemplate. And I don't know any interesting examples of T2.5 spaces that are not T3, for example. Okay, so what are the key examples here? Well, first, let's just observe that every compact Hausdorff space is T4. Remember, what does T4 mean? T4 means that every pair of disjoint closed subspaces can be separated by open neighborhoods. Well, if they're disjoint closed neighborhoods of a compact Hausdorff space, then in particular, they themselves are compact, and inside a compact Hausdorff space, you can always find neighborhoods that are disjoint that separate your two compacta. Another observation is that all of these axioms, T0 through T6, are enjoyed by metric spaces. As soon as you have access to a distance function, as you have in a metric space, then you can start to construct a function that will precisely separate any two closed subsets of x. As a result, any metric space is t6, and therefore it's ti for i less than 6 as well. So why is this interesting? This is really about fine-tuning the conditions that we have on theorems. T2, as I mentioned, is important because of its interplay with compactness. T3 allows us to use closed neighborhoods systematically in place of open neighborhoods. T3 and a half is pretty interesting because it ensures the stone check compactification that we defined last time is Hausdorff. And not only that, but that the map from X into the stone check compactification is actually the inclusion of a dense open subset. This isn't something that you could expect with a space that isn't T3 and a half. So for that purpose, it's quite a useful condition. And T4 is quite remarkable for the following reason. It ensures something that is a priori stronger, and that's the Urizone lemma. 
The Urizone lemma says that if you have a T4 topological space, then every pair of closed subsets that are disjoint are separated by a function. That is to say, there's a function from x to the closed interval from 0 to 1, such that all the points of z1 go to 0, and all the points of z2 go to 1. This is quite a strong theorem. This is saying that even if the topological spaces you've constructed have nothing to do with the real numbers, and don't come in any way from thinking about the real numbers, it will nevertheless be true that if you're t4, then you have a good supply of functions to a subset of the real line that is capable of distinguishing closed subsets. It separates these closed subsets. Even better, we have what's called the Tietze extension theorem. The Tietze extension theorem says that if we have a T4 topological space X, and we have a closed subset of it, and a continuous map from that closed subset to the real line, then I'm able to extend that map to a continuous map from all of X to the real line in such a way that what it does to the points of Z is just little f. So big F extends little f. So in the next two lectures, we're going to prove the Eurozone and Tietze extension theorems. And you'll notice that if we had access to the Tietze extension theorem, the Eurozone lemma would simply follow. But in fact, the logic that we're going to follow goes the other way. We're first going to prove the Eurozone lemma, and then we're going to use it to prove the Tietze extension theorem. And so that's all in the lectures to come.